guys doing here? What are you doing? I was going to take those off. I guess he can. Simmerson Lake and Palmer uh. coming to this place? What is How cool is this, you guys? This is incredible. Wow. Hello. We've got our extended KLOS family here. Welcome. Here with the Robinson brothers, Chris, Rich, you guys. You Hello. guys. Hello. Hi. This is awesome. Huge news this week. Um, I'm not kidding. I was on a plane a few weeks ago. I was sitting next to, a, a, weeks ago, I was sitting next to this guy. We were talking music. The Black Crows came up. Don't know how you came up, but you did. And I said, oh, it would be so great. Be so great if they could work things out and do some shows again. And is that my cousin what Curtis? What a bummer! It might, maybe. And is that is that what is <laughs> that how, what got this whole thing started? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now look at us. This is incredible. We're here to talk about a reunion with the Black Crows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the best news. I'm I'm such a big fan, and uh, there's a lot of listeners who've been calling in and just they're shrieking with excitement. They're so cool. So, cool. So yeah, happy we're very us. excited as well. Yeah. So. Uh, Long time coming. Yeah, definitely. And what brought you to this point? How did you guys, uh, w you know, work through it and get get here? Where I we mean, I think working through it is going to be like a theme, you know. Uh, but I mean, you know how life, you know, life works, and you know, life is full of cruel mysteries. Um, it's been a long time, you know, and I think Rich and I, you know, we went many years without speaking to each other. Right. And I mean, I think at one level, people with family and siblings, whether you work with them or not, it's tough, you know? I mean, uh, in any dynamic, but when you work together and, and then you're in something like rock and roll, which can be, you know, the, it, which is the most beautiful, I mean, Rich and I will always agree, uh, we're humble in the face of the tradition we get to work in. But you're young and stuff happens, all cool stuff, but it's a lot of pressure and, uh, yeah, eventually we just, we just ended up not being able to deal. But I've been through a lot of changes, Rich has been through a lot of changes, uh, and then it just seemed like, you know. You guys both came together and said, hey, let's do this? Yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh. <laughs> this one? That's not working. All right. That was goes with your eyes. Yes, it does. Yeah, so it wasn't... I mean, uh, also, you... when you care about what we do as much as we do. Right. You know what I mean? So it was always uh, important to us. But, yeah, I mean, family is more important than all of it. And, and so to be able to kind of come back and really focus on that, you know, because this is what, where we always... Like, making music was never the issue for us. You know what I mean? And to come back in such a positive light and come back and play these songs that we wrote when we were kids in my mom's living room. <laughs> <laughs> in, the li in the living Literally, room. Literally, I was in high school, so. Shake Your Money Maker. Uh, let's go back to 1989. You guys, are, so you guys are recording. Did you have any idea, any inkling that this album was going to be this huge, go five times platinum, uh, this, <clears throat> this cultural piece of music? Yeah, uh, we were confident. <laughs> yeah, and now you're doing this, we I mean, like, you're doing I this full-blown tour. Playing... Classic so, you know, rock celebrated. music with Next to Poison. It's going to be huge <laughs> in Guns N' Roses. I mean, I think, you know, for us, I mean, like Rich said, music was always important. I mean, that was our thing. You know, we were... Looking back, like getting back into this record and, uh, you know, this was going to be the project that we played, this record. We never played this record when we made it. When it came out, we never played it the, all of it. We never played it in sequence. But I was listening to it, and it was like, uh, wow, there's an Otis Redding song. There's a, like, Stax ballad, you know, kind of in seeing things. I was like, yeah, that wasn't the what the average rock and roll terrain looked like, you know? And I think for us, too, we weren't really, like, a typical Southern group, because to us, Southern music was you know, Big Star and R.E.M. and bands like that just as much as, uh, or Driving and Crying or whatever, just as much as Leonard Skinner or the Allman Brothers or whatever. So, I mean, for us, it was just trying to, how do we put our interest in roots music into like this kind of supercharged rock and roll? I mean, because you guys, did, would you consider yourselves punk before? With the, I mean, the, uh, I, I, I don't think there would be any <laughs> other adjective yeah, yeah. <laughs> to describe our <laughs> attitudes and yeah. behavior. 
I mean, again, this is in the, in the late 80s, this is uh, indie rock vibes, you know? Like, um, REM, they made like a real stand, you know what I mean? Like, when we grew up in Atlanta, if you signed with a major label, people would be really like, that's, what's, that's not cool, you know? <laughs> like, um, you're a sellout or whatever. No, one, no kids today would even know what that means or where the lines were drawn between making a, a statement uh, philosophically, politically, like about how you were living and what your art was, you know? And then for that record to be so commercially uh, successful was like, you know, a, like another like, whoa, you know? I mean, and to me, we were laughing like, this is the most punk rock thing we could do. <laughs> 30 years later is to actually celebrate this record and focus on it and like present it and yeah. you know with these guys and you know there is a full I mean it's it sounds cliche but it's a full circle uh, vibration right. you know and you recorded it you were back and forth right Atlanta Los Angeles we right. recorded uh, yeah I mean I did um, all the, the all the music was done in Atlanta and then yeah, I had never, it's crazy. All the firsts happen when you're a kid, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's the first really bunch of songs we put together the first time we were in a recording studio. I mean, we were laughing at dinner, like we flew out here and like the first time we ever had sushi was 1989. I mean, and we were like poking <laughs> at it, like what did we do with this? You know what I mean? Like all these things. Uh, but I sang, I sang all the all the vocals here. Yeah. Grandmaster Studios is that? That that's was pretty one. Close to here. Uh, there were a few. Uh, I sang a lot of it at Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics oh, home yeah. studio, yeah. out in like Woodland Hills or something, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of punk too because at that the summer of 1989, there was a law that you couldn't all the studios and all the record companies didn't want people working in their homes they would really be out of luck today uh, with digital everything you know but yeah it was uh you know i remember flying home with the cassette of like the the finished stuff and like what was that feeling like well i didn't want to go through the <laughs> metal detector you know because i thought it would erase everything and like we would never get another one you know uh, it was super exciting but i don't think you know I think it's the excitement doesn't it doesn't wear off for us. I mean, you know, we were saying, how do you get here? You know, um, Rich and I have both been in solo careers, you know, and <clears throat> in the last couple of years, you know, I fell in love and like left a a bad relationship, and in my new relationship, my partner's like, what did, what happened with you guys? Like, I don't. She never met Rich. She doesn't yeah, yeah. really oh, know yeah, the Black yeah. Crows the same way. Like, what is that about? What is that? And it's like. You start chipping away a little bit. What is that? Why don't I, you know, my daughter, you know, my older son knows some of his cousins. And my daughter's like, who's my Uncle Rich? You know, who are my cousins? You know, this, again, it gets back to the, it's one thing to be in a magazine and say, I don't like him and this and that. But then the reality is when your kids are like, what, why, Dad? You're like, oh, I don't, I'm going to have to really dig deep and figure right. it out, you know? Absolutely. What would you say? Um, are you guys still involved with your solo projects, by the way? No, I mean, I, you know, we're doing this right now. Yeah, focus. Yeah. Uh, what was your, what would you say your best memory is when you were recording? I'm sure there's some great stories. <laughs> when you were recording Shake Your Money Maker. There's got to be some good stories. There's a lot of good stories with our friend George Draculius and... <laughs> uh, want to share? We, share with we the were class. horrible <laughs> kids, you know, and... There was no money and stuff, so, you know, we would eat whatever George wouldn't finish, and, like, he would always buy, like, a big Coke and let us all share it, and <laughs> we didn't have money for weed or for booze or anything, you know, so it was, kind of, it was really innocent and funny, but doing this, you know, the song we're going to play, like, that, we were telling the guys in the band, because on, on Thick and Thin on Shake Your Moneymaker, there's a car crash before the song starts. And I imagine, like, these guys, they were like, oh, where, you find a piece of tape or from a, you know, old, you know, the streets of San Francisco and you tape it off the TV or something when there's a car crash or whatever. But no, we, we crashed a car into a dumpster to do that, you know, like. That is so punk rock. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> we could, you know, there, we, we thought, yeah, it's, you know, it was, we, we had the afternoon free. <laughs> 
So we had to bring like, you know, a hundred yards of mic cables, like every mic cable in the studio, through the studio, out the door, through the front where they had the big dumpster. And so you pull the car back, put it in gear and smash it into the dumpster a few times. And we picked the best take, you know, right. like without, we were into vandalism then, you know. <laughs> were there psychedelics involved? No, we didn't have money for psychedelics then. Yeah, I mean, that would, if someone was going to, uh, you know, if we were, I don't even think, that wasn't even a thing. We were just working so, you threw everything we had into it at the time, you know. There was nothing, no stone left unturned. I mean, uh, just pushing ourselves the hardest we could with whatever we had available. I mean, we only had one amp and two guitars. I mean, we were calling friends and can we please borrow an amp? But we were such horrible kids. They were like, no, you guys are just going to mess it up, you know. <laughs> we're like, no, no. But we did break our friend's guitar. Like, first day, it was an accident. But it was like, we were like, we got a real guitar. We turn around and it like falls over and the neck flies off. We're like, oh, <laughs> he's going to kill us, you know. So it was just real, it was super innocent, you know. Yeah. Like, we were just kids, like, trying to, you know, make a big racket, you know. There's reports out there that say she talks to angels. Uh, it's about a girl that you knew. Was that you, Chris? I, it, the that, song isn't is it, really, like, about her, you know? It was, again, like, that song, we're so lucky to have a song like that that resonates over the decades and the story that people can attach themselves. But, yeah, I knew a girl in Atlanta who was kind of like this goth chick. And, uh, I mean, I just kind of, and I, you know, whatever, whatever, if she was... Um, into drugs or whatever. Um, I don't even know if that part of it was true, but I know she didn't have kids and stuff, so I made up the, you know, I'm, I was telling Probably the story. Yeah. And, you know, why not? Well, no, I mean, you know, it was all part of the scene, but I, I, you know, that I used her sort of as a, just as the opening line of the song, and then I made up a bunch of stuff about her that wasn't probably true. Maybe it was. I subsequently saw her a little bit in Atlanta. I don't remember her Wait, name. And so stuff. you don't keep in touch. Does she know that that? I think she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of about yeah. her. I think she did at the time. But again, not like, why would you say these things about me? You know? She did smash a, a yuppie dude in the face with a, with a beer bottle in the club we played one night, which was pretty rad. Well, you didn't leave her alone. That's this pretty was, badass. I mean. This was before the Me Too movement, <laughs> and uh, she took matters into her own hand that fair eve. And, uh, but again, in the 80s in Atlanta, a yuppie dude going into that club and acting like that, he kind of got what he deserved, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> So Shake Your Moneymaker is named after a song written by Elmore James. So why not cover that and put it on the album? Uh, I've been wanting to ask that for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, well, number one, I don't think we were probably good enough to be playing Elmore James music at the time. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, it was not, things don't have to be so literal, you know? I mean, I think the point of it, you know, like, there's so much, like, uh, down and out culture at right. that time. Like I said, we didn't sign a big record deal. It's not like, you know, we signed on the dotted line and like, you know, some Jaguars showed up and a Porsche, you know what I mean? We literally, it was, we were lucky to have, to just be in the studio making the record. You were begrudgingly signed. Begrudgingly. By the label. <laughs> George was into it, but Rick was like, yeah, whatever. I mean, if you think about it, what, you know, we didn't look like the other bands, we didn't sound like, when we first came to Los Angeles, uh, I remember going to the, meet the people at the record company, and they were asking, like, where our parents were, because, like, they thought, we, you're the band? We were like, yeah. They're like, y'all sound like this? You know, like, you sound a lot older than you look, you know? Rich was still 20 years old, you know? He turned 21 on tour, you know, so... Again, it was like, it's hard to, um, it's hard to think about as three decades go by, but, you know, you could probably count the gigs we had done on, on each of our hands, you know, up until the day we were making that record, and that changed pretty quickly, but, uh, you know, so, I mean, I think with, it was beautiful, you know, youth is beautiful, and youth is like, exciting and there's a little bit more you know you have nothing to lose so you're just wild you know you were just we were just wild but back to like again there's lots of stuff on there I mean that's the writing and the nothing is should be that literal 
you know. Right. So Shake Your Money Maker was more like a, a thing that encompassed <clears throat> blues, R&B, soul music, a certain attitude we had, a sexy je ne sais quoi, if you will. Uh, uh, you know, so it was more about a, a vibe than something, you know, like, oh, we're playing blues or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Joshua Tree, Hotel California, we've got these bands, U2, the Eagles, they are touring, and they're touring in support of their biggest album. Do you think this is the onset of a trend that's going to continue with bands who are going to, they're going to tour and play the, their most Did the their Eagles most never popular not album do that? I mean, you know, like, they're the never. Eagles. They have like the biggest record of all time. Yeah, I mean, doing if you go see the Eagles time. and they don't play Hotel in California, people are going to like be upset, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I think the trend... You know, again, for where Rich and I are, we never did anything remotely like that. Uh, just out of our own... I think, I, <clears throat> I think we ran away from Shake Your Money Maker, yeah. you know, pretty quickly. And, and went out into the great wide open of experimentation musically, you know what I mean? I mean, we were proud of the record, we loved the record. But by the time we did 350 shows on the Shake Your Money Maker tour, in like 18 months. And by then we were so done with, <laughs> done with it, you know. We wanted to, so over the years with Southern Harmony and Amorica and as we kind of got further away from it. Yeah. So to look back at this, it's almost like, I mean, to me it's like a new record, you know. It's, it's coming back and really focusing on this thing. Yeah the, yeah, the way it is now. So and you I, feel like you got out of your system what you needed to. We just thought it was a cool it. idea to focus on this record, because we've never done it. We're like, yeah, that's pretty interesting, you know? And it's a big one, and it's a soundtrack to so many people's lives, yeah. you know? So that's... Did, cool. this, I mean, R R you, Rich and I have b bickered and argued over tons of stuff, but th this, is a, this is a cool record was never one of the issues, you know? I mean, that's the thing. Rich and I would... Like you said, you know, like something happened, and everyone lays this trip on you about how successful it is, and... I've told people my whole life, especially young bands, it's like, and I, and I still love music, and I've, you know, young bands, older bands, we go see concerts, and I was just at Amoeba for two hours buying records, and, <clears throat> you know, for us, the, the, the whole idea of, like, like I said, where we're coming from at that time is like, success is almost bad, you know what I mean? So that was kind of a hard way to kind of like, well, how do we fit into this, you know, because yeah. we're not on a showbiz trip and, you know, that punk rock sort of business in our minds about how they give you the keys to the, to the, to the city, so let's, let's run amok, you know, because they're going to take it away from us at any minute, you know. I mean, that's how it felt. There was no, I mean, God, how many great bands and musicians have come and gone in three decades of bands that we're the next big thing and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, I always knew, you know, there was a lot of them versus us in our attitudes. Yeah. Uh, some people, that spilled over <laughs> into a lot of like opinionated stuff and, you know, for better or for worse. But I, I also think that's what people uh, identified with us, you know, like, well, here's a band that's not playing those games and I, I want my rock and roll with a little defiance you know mm -hmm. i want my rock and roll with somebody who's not afraid to have a little of the guff you know what i mean yeah. and uh, i mean that's the bands we like the rolling stones weren't running around being saying the most positive thing you know what i mean yeah. or whoever all the bands we love the most were seem to be real independent spirited bands and um and not just the bands the painters and the authors and the filmmakers and the comedians and all the things I liked were always seeing people who were uh, not afraid to, you know, I, I didn't have a character. It was just, it was just me, you know, for better or for worse. Sometimes if you have a character, I think it's easier not to put your foot in your mouth as much, but so be it, you know. The Stones or Beatles? <laughs> That's I hate how they pivot to I mean, from, each other. It's funny, me and Camille argue about this all the time. I mean, the Beatles are the Beatles, but, the, but I mean, it's the Rolling Stones. I don't have a Beatles tattoo, but I have a Rolling Stones tattoo. See, I think that's our answer. So, yeah. so that's all you need to know. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, Which one for you? Yeah. Who are we talking about? <laughs> I would say the Stones. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
the, sw the swaggers, yeah. Chris said, it was, you know, the cool thing about being kids is Chris was always would, amidst all of the other things he would say, these brilliant things of great wisdom would just poke out, poke their head out. And a lot of times it was peppered with defiance and peppered with like, why did he say? <laughs> but one thing he said, and it was, it, it always rang true. It's like when you make someone a lot of money, they keep, they want you to keep making them money. And that's kind of, and that's when, although we were always on our path making the music we wanted to make, making the records we wanted to make, but that started becoming more and more insidious and sort of working its way from external sources, working its way in between Chris and I. You know, a former person that we uh, associated with told me when you and Chris got along, it scared everyone in the band because we couldn't make you do what we wanted you to do. There was no stopping you when the two of you guys got along. And so you look back and you, and you see the manipulation, you see the division that comes and, you know, so. You know, knowing that we, we allowed it to happen in our naivete or, or you know, we're really, uh, we're loyal too, you know, in yeah. our own. And we were, we were playing our music, just doing our thing and, you know, someone's like, that guy said this. And they're like, what? Fuck that guy. Well, that guy said this. Well, fuck that guy. And then, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, sorry. sorry nah, we're not live. It's okay. Beep, beep. <laughs> you can Tri say fuck. It's fine. Triple you just beep. can't say fuck on the radio. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> so ultimately that's, you know, that's interesting. And then the path that we went through, we learned, you know, kind of learned a lot of that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, the hard lessons to yeah. learn. But uh, who do, everyone has hard lessons to learn. If you're going to survive, I mean, we've all said goodbye to people we love too young and too early, family and friends, you know what I mean? So if you have the opportunity to still be here, you know what I mean? I don't, and especially, like, if you get to play music, I, I, never, I never was going to take it lightly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even if it was difficult for other people. If, my, if our, my decision was difficult because I'm like, <laughs> you know, to... For, I was never like a breadhead, you know? So it's like, you could throw as much money at me as you wanted, but I was just too stubborn to listen. Yeah. That's not rock and roll, and that's not the Black Crows, and we're not doing it. And, they're, and I think it, one thing, Rich and I would probably be more similar to that than anybody else. You know what I mean? Mm. I'm not a Marxist, or, <laughs> you know, we're capitalists. Money's fantastic. Success is fantastic. I would never deny that. But I think, you know... Like I said, it's part, of, it's part of my right as an artist to be difficult if I want. And in this day and age of everyone doing whatever any corporate sort of scenario tells them to do, I think even, it's even more important to um, stand your ground sometimes, you know, like and uh, do it for other reasons. You know, there has to be some other reason than just financial reasons, you know. That moment you guys came together, that had to feel really good, you know, when you came to, you worked through it and you yeah. decided, I mean, this is, this is a big deal. I mean, I think we both, like I said, in our solo careers, very proud of, of the music I made, very different presentation, very different than the Black Crows. Rich was very proud of the music he made, but when we got in the room together to start the audition process and... He starts playing Jealous again. It's like, oh, that's the way it's supposed to go, you know? And uh, I think he feels the same when I sing the songs and what I do as a front man in this band mm -hmm. and the energy I put into it and uh, the vibes I want to put out. That's, that's, that's just what we do, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, our, that's, our, that's our trip, you know? Yeah. I'm being told, we, we, do you want to go, Rich? Cool. It, it just, no, I'm good. I was being told to rap, so you guys want to break out the guitars? and We're going to play a couple songs for you. Uh, have some free sound check. Thank you. Thank you guys so much.